two o'clock and we are here um, at week nine with Megan Torrance, uh, who's going to talk about now what do you do with all the data? So we're glad that everyone is here with us today. Um, and this web session is recorded for folks who aren't. Uh, we are officially at 612 people registered for cohort this semester. Um, and we have our ninth presentation today with Megan Torrance that's going to share. Now, what do I do with all this data? Um, we'll have our team check in. So if you're here to represent some your team, let us know in the chat which team you'll be representing and we'll get you all teed up to present out when we get to that section of the presentation today. Behind the mics, I we actually don't have Aaron today. Um, Aaron is taking some well-deserved PTO and vacation time, but we do have Jamie and myself. Um, so if you have any tech needs or anything there, um, feel yes, yeah, spring break. Um, feel free to let us know, and we can help you. Today, we're going to talk about now what do I do with all this data? So we've been following the semester, um, getting big picture about what XAPI is, what it can do, what are all the elements of an ecosystem, um, and what, what are XAPI states, statements and profiles, um, and what are some different standards that work with IEEE, and then creating data visualizations and dashboards. Uh, today we'll hop into what are some strategic analytic thinking things that we can do with data. And then next week we'll have some case studies by Art Workentin and Duncan Welder um, with RISC. And then we'll hop into project team demos. And I have my first team that signed up for their demo, so I'm super excited about that. And we have more space and room for you to sign up today or in Slack. With that, I'm going to pass over the mic to Megan um, to present her presentation. Now, what do I do with all of this data? Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Uh, and a huge shout out to uh, whichever team signed up for their first demo. Um, these are, uh, uh, well, when I'm not talking about XAPI, I'm spending a lot of time talking about iterative development uh, and getting that, that feedback from those, uh, those releases and those demos uh, as a really meaningful way to, to get insight into your work. So I'm super excited to see what people have been uh, working on uh, this uh, semester. I kind of like semesters, right? Uh, so I'm super geeked for that. Um, Generally in this time slot, we, or this, this session slot, if you've been following along with cohort, we generally have a, a flow of how these go. Um, and we would generally have case studies from real live working projects out there. And it's not that there aren't real live working projects out there, uh, but I still feel like we may be suffering a little bit of um, I don't know, pandemic time warp. I don't know about you, every day is the same, but time flies really fast. Uh, so we had a, a, a hole in the, the schedule and Jess and I were talking about uh, kind of what, what do we do here? And it has occurred to me in the last couple of sessions that we have talked about like why you would do analytics. And we talked about, I mean, um, Rob, Chadwick last week had some like really, really down and dirty specifics around don't enter statements like this way, otherwise you're not going to get your data out, which is absolutely valuable. Um, but I was craving really a kind of like, how do I put it together and do this fancy thing called analytics, right? Um, if you think of XAPI as the underpinning and the the all of the the plumbing right how do i get my data there then what do i do with all of this data and so um what i am sharing with you this is the first run of a, a, a presentation um and i am very keenly interested in a couple pieces of data uh today one is does this session solve a need that you have had <laughs> Right. Um, I've tried to tap into some of the questions I've seen in the the the, the uh, chat and, and out in Slack, but I really would love to know either real time as we go or uh, afterwards. Does this solve a need that you have? And either way, yes or no. Um, how does this fit with your idea for where, what you wanted to do with the data? Right. Why you were here in the first place. Is this a framework that you can you can work with? Uh, so with that uh, that that request, um, uh, 
I am going to get started. And, and I will say this is not an April Fool's joke because I'm not clever enough to do April Fool's. This is actually one of my least favorite years, uh, days of the year. Um, I have in my kind of broader presentation around XAPI and why you should do it, a slide in which I show a multiple pieces of data right, that an organization has. And here's the point of this, right? Um, the, hey, cohort team, my slide deck just went blank. Or my screen just went blank. So I'm going to keep talking and maybe my slides will come back. Um, awesome. Thank you. That's like magic. Just put it out in the universe and my slides come back. Um, right? So this, this you know, I, I, I talk about, right, your sales team has wicked data. Your supply chain team has wicked data. Uh, your website team, do you realize Google Analytics is something like 15 years old and it's free, right? Gobs and gobs of data about all sorts of things that happen on a website, right? Really powerful stuff. Um, if you've got a Fitbit, you've got a dashboard, so I don't have a Fitbit, but um, you've got a dashboard that looks something like this, you have more information about your data, your health and your fitness and everything than your LMS has about what goes on in learning in the organization, right? So we have these silos of data. We don't have nearly as much data as everybody until now, right? We are about to turn on the spigot of data. We have to figure out what to do with it. And before you say, wait, 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 training, learning, it's an art. We can't possibly drive back performance to a specific training element, right? Um, don't, don't box us in. Don't make us accountable for those results because there's so much that happens between when we teach people to do something and when they do it on the job. I want to remind you that marketing was once a dark art. I actually have an undergraduate degree in communication. And for a little while, I flirted with public relations and marketing in which we did not want to be measured in the late 1980s, right? We had, it was creative and there was like, a, a, like it was mysterious and amazing, um, but not necessarily directly related to sales, right? We didn't want to be on the hook for that. Of course, of course, it improved sales but we didn't want to be on the hook for it, right? Marketing was once a dark art. And if you think about the amount of data that your marketing team right now has and uses, right? It's amazing. Data-driven marketing is the thing, right? So I think that we will see that learning will have the same kind of trajectory as marketing has had, right? And that we will do it faster for a couple of reasons. One, we get to learn from what marketing has done and learn on, you know, based on what we've got on a lot of the existing tools and processes and organizations and relationships, right, with, within an organization. But what we also have is a shared and interoperable data spec, which means we can just buy tools off the shelf or buy programming and custom development by people off the street that all works within our ecosystem right away. Right? That's what we've been building up to right now. It's why Shelly Blake Clock was telling us we need a standard, right? We're moving this from a specification to a standard. It's why Aaron Silvers is working so hard on the profiles project, right? So to be able to get us that, that data, right? So yay, data. I probably did not need to convince anybody here uh, that we need more data. I like to think of though, right? There's this continuum of what we can measure, right? Everything from nothing to useless overkill. Um, and then somewhere in between there along that continuum are what we currently measure today, which I think we can all agree in this group is pretty shallow and what we know we probably need to be measuring, <laughs> right? And so somewhere in there is where we're going to play today uh, with our data and, and what, we're, what we're doing. And so I've been baking up for about two years, ago, years now. I've been really thinking about how do I craft this and pull this all together into a cohesive framework? Um, and there's been a lot of really interesting work that's been done. The, the rest of this slide deck um, is, is littered with 
URLs and references that I realize are locked up in the slide deck. So I will post out into the cohort channel um, all of the links from this slide deck so you can all follow them because I want you to be able to get back to those regular sources. Um, and um, I, 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 I've really been working on pulling together what I was hoping would be a unifying framework. So 40 years ago, 39 years ago, actually, I looked this up. Um, I don't know about you. Um, I saw the movie Dark Crystal. Uh, I don't remember most of it other than these amazing creatures. And each piece had, like each creature had a piece of the um, the crystal, right? And you all brought, they brought them together and each facet made this most amazing and incredible, powerful thing. And I've been trying to, I'm a big, I'm a visual thinker, right? I've been trying to put together all the facets of what I'm about to show you. And I couldn't make it all be one beautiful jewel for you. So today I'm going to throw at you a bunch of different um, ways of thinking at and coming at this that all intersect and overlap in some way, but I have yet, yet to make them be that overall unifying, beautiful thing of a powerful crystal. Um, so with that, let's dive in, right? Um, big data is sexy, right? Data is really, really um, it's fascinating. All the, the big, well-paid people in our organizations um, get lots and lots of data, right? Data science is, is the, the hot new job that we all wish we had um, or wonder if we should, right? And um, for all intents and purposes, right, the work that we are doing in L&D won't, for most of us, achieve the realm of big data. But there's a lot that we can learn from what's going on with big data that we can apply, right? Um, so I like to think of this, I believe David Kelly coined this phrase uh, from the Learning Guild, enough data, right? And whenever we talk about big data or enough data, right? Um, there are some impl implications of this, right? Um, it's data from multiple sources. It is both structured, think something I can report out that's rectangular and unstructured where it is a ragged right paragraph mishmash. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're long, sometimes it lo looks like lorem ipsum, right? All in the same pool. It is way more than you can handle in Excel and often way more than you can handle in most analytics platforms, right? It requires math and statistics to really get to that power. And I can continue to add to it. It is extensible. I can add and connect more pieces of data over time that did not exist when I created it. If you think about LMSs and why they have such a hard time reporting on things like video or checklists or performance support, it's because those concepts as learning data sources arrived on the scene after that LMS was created after SCORM was designed, it doesn't know how to handle those different pieces of data because they're in a different shape, right? And XAPI, right? If you think about all these bullet points, right? XAPI is what allows us to work with each one of these implications of enough data. Fine grained, right? Think about how much detail and the granularity at which you can have um, an XAPI statement as opposed to what you're getting out of an LMS in SCORM, right? You completed the course. Great. <laughs> Yay, you, you completed the course. Right? And it tells us nothing about that, the experience within that course, right? Um, <laughs> And the thing is, is that SCORM reports so much more about that experience than we ever get out of, 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 of web sessions like this. Well, maybe not this one, right? Because uh, New Row is tracking. Um, but, or a live classroom or an on-the-job coaching session, right? Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, possibility. And then relational, right? When I have a relational set of data, I have index values that I can use to connect different pieces of data. And even if there's not one unifying index value, I can create a profile that does that, uh, right? And so I can relate, I have a, a, a relational set of concepts around people, 
right? And I can have all the things that Megan does in the environment, right? And so as you spot on, I have my email address or my single sign on um, that I use across multiple platforms. Okay? So I have that relational. There may also be a device that has an ID that we can then connect different types of records to that device. The device may have um, a, a, an information stream from it. That device may also have a service record, right? And so, and an asset tag, right? And so that data, right, can then be connected because then you can connect Megan to a device via a, an activity and suddenly we're joining two different data sets and that's where it starts to get really, really exciting. So these are some of the things that are really, um, they're, they're big data concepts, right? Uh, but we have these concepts in our work when we're using XAPI, we're doing learning analytics, right? And learning data. So I'm gonna share with you one more thing and I'm so excited about this because it kind of looks like a crystal. Um, but the the one of the concepts from big data that I also want to key in on here, right, are the V's of data. And depending on where you look and the date of the, the age of your source, started out with four V's of big data, and then there were five V's, and then I've also seen six and seven and eight. Honestly, I just picked one in the middle, right? Um, so the V's of data, right? and, what, and what you're thinking about is when I'm, I'm working with data, what do I need to make sure that I've got an, enough to be making meaningful decisions, right? And enough is not only in terms of volume, well, that, that's a piece, right? We all get the, the general consensus uh, or the, the, the general concept, right, of statistically significant. Right. Um, I need enough volume to be able to slice it up into buckets that then ha are still themselves big enough to be able to do something with. Right. Um, variety. Does it come from a variety of data sources? Do I have variety? If everybody completes a course, I can't tell you anything interesting about completion. I need some sort of variety. Right. And so in a SCORM in an LMS environment, my variety comes into like, when did you complete the course? Yeah, that's interesting. Not really, right? Um, and so, right, to Helena's point, our LMSs are restricted. And here's the other thing. We've gotten used to that, right? Um, and so the, there's there, that volume, that variety, veracity, right? Can I believe it? Right? Is it coming from true sources that I can rely on? Velocity. Sorry, velocity, not veracity. Wow. Uh, right. Velocity. Can I get the data? There's two parts of velocity, right? Can I get the data fast enough to be able to use it in a meaningful amount of time? Because I don't know about you, every time I hear on the news somebody reporting about, you know, 2019 data, according, you know, 2019 traffic data statistics, I'm like, 2019 is so irrelevant. It may be the last year for which we have meaningful data because we haven't been had enough time yet in 2021 to process 2020. We all know that 2020 data is weird. And so, right, do we get our data fast enough to be able to make decisions on it? Thank you, um, everybody, for responding to Steve's question because it's kind of a little off track from where I'm going. And so, Steve, we're going to take care of you in the chat because you have lots of experts here. The other thing about velocity is, can I process it fast enough? So I took a data science class uh, in the spring and I thought, well, I'll be brilliant. I'm just going to ask Matt Cleaver to dump me um, a set of a five day set of data out of one of our XAPI learning experiences. And that's going to be my data set um, that I'm going to use for this data science course. I was super geeked, feeling super like on top of the world because I had access to this data set. <laughs> and and the, the premise of the course was that all the things we were going to learn, you can do in Excel, right? And so I go to open up the, I think, what, 37,000 odd rows of data that five days happened to be, and my machine just crashed. It was such a big data set that I couldn't even open up Excel enough to be able to cut out data to be able to use it, right? So the velocity of my current processing speed in that moment 
not going to cut it, right? So that's another thing uh, to think about. Obviously, most of the time we're not doing these things in Excel on our own laptops. Once we get to any kind of power and volume, um, but the when we do start talking about mega amounts of data, velocity of processing speed is important. Variability gets to again, right? Am I getting different? <laughs> D different sources of data, um, different information in that data that I can use to do something interesting, and that interesting gets to value, right? There is zero point, right? My first, um, or one of my first, uh, you know, L and D jokes that I, I was hip to uh, was um, I can't remember who said it, uh, but but basically it was in the concept of of um, learning evaluation and you know based on the shallow data we were getting it's like we might as well just weigh the participants before and after training and see if we were able to add any weight to them right um and so uh the, 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 that's obviously of no value right so the the v's of data right so we've got big data concepts. We've got lots of things going on we've we've, we've ensured that we have six v's of data right and then what do we do with our data? And we spent a lot of time getting really, really excited about analytics, but I have been spending a fair amount of time in doing some research, right? That analytics is not the only thing that we can do with data. And we kind of know this, right? Um, remember, I'm a communication major. And so most of that major is really, you know, it's like four years of like, oh, well, yeah, of course, that makes sense. I just never thought about it that way, right? So here's what, right, what we can do with the data. And while these look like, I, I'm kind of limited by the, the, the PowerPoint smart art I used to make this little graphic. Um, this looks like moving from left to right is necessarily the positive direction that you want to go. And each one of these can be meaningful in and of itself, right? Here in cohort, um, most of the time we are digging through data. Yay, we got data. <laughs> Yay, I can see that somebody logged in and somebody logged out and here's how they answered the question, right? Um, and, and there's a lot of value in that digging through it piece. And then there's a lot of visualization that we can do that is super cool, right? And these are not necessarily, but kind of, Right? Um, in a left to right order, right? Um, so visualizing, I can make charts and I can make graphs and I can make dashboards and drill down tables and those are super, super cool, right? Um, I'll tell you, I used to uh, <laughs> I used to manage a, an outsource HR function and uh, I had uh, four different data sources that I would dump monthly into a series of Excel spreadsheets with pivot tables and charts that I would then screenshot paste into a PowerPoint and print as a PDF and give that as a dashboard, um, it's like early 2000s, right, uh, to the senior executives who were ecstatic about the access to data that they had, right? Um, so, so visualization is awesome. Um, and I think what I like about great visualizations is they tell a very powerful story very, very quickly um, or a very wrong story very, very quickly, depending on the visualization, right? And they buy you time until you get to analyzing. We're gonna dive in a little bit more into analysis because that's where a lot of us are gonna spend time um, uh, in, in our work in, um, uh, in, in learning as well as using it in learning experiences. So. I will tell you, I used to get super, super pumped for analytics. Yeah, analytics, that's what we want, right? That's the hot buzzword right now, analytics, right? And there's a lot of cool things that we can do there, but analytics and using the data are different things, right? Analytics, just what one use of it, right? When I say using it in the learning experience, I can use data, right? to personalize, I can use data to recommend, I can use data in engagement, right? Um, whether it's gamification or achievement or pointing out, hey, Megan, yesterday you spent four and a half minutes learning about data science. You wanna go to five today? Oh, I sure do because I am one competitive woman, right? So I'm using that to personalize and engage me in the learning, right? It's a, a wonderful use of data and it's separate from analytics. Um, and then the other thing we can do with data is to initiate actions, right? So Anthony Altieri has this great use case, right? Where um, you build training for how to use a forklift and uh, you get in the forklift, 
you turn the forklift knows who you are because you've got your badge on you turn the key and it's like eh, nothing if you haven't completed your training the forklift doesn't even start okay um what about uh say you're a salesperson and we're tracking all the things that you sell and you create a an opportunity okay for a product you've not been trained on and you've not ever sold before maybe we push you training maybe vice versa now that you have completed training right and succeeded at it we built a, a, a program for a client that once you had completed training you were automatically given deals that were related right you were given leads for new business that were related to the training that you had created it's not analytics it's not personalizing the learning experience it's actually driving business actions as a result okay. so lots and lots of cool things along this continuum i'm going to pause real real quick here um i'm going to drink uh some coffee out of my xapi mug um i'm channeling my xapi ness what thoughts or questions do we have right now before we actually do do a deeper dive into analytics and then also for me the flip side feedback is this relevant interesting and the kinds of things that people are are curious about as we go and we can just type this into chat rather than um Fool around with mics. Okay, Judy finds it interesting. All right, Dan loves it, Helena loves it, and she's amazing. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving then. Uh, um, definitely interested wondering on how to activate on the data. Hey Pedro, if you could let me know what you mean by activating on the data, that would be awesome. A framework for analysis should have come at the beginning. Uh, Kieran, are you talking about at the beginning of cohort? or the beginning of anyone's thoughts around um, analytics. And Brian wants more. This is helpful, Margaret. Thank you, awesome cohort. Oh yeah. You know, actually Karen, that's an interesting, that is an interesting thought because we, uh, our, 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 our curriculum is really figured out, really wrapped around how do we get you started with data and doing something. So that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. Using the data to create actionable insight to incorporate into learning solutions. Okay, Pedro, I think we're getting there. Hold tight. Sean, that's interesting. Deconstructed by whole by showing the end. Okay, yep, yep. Uh, um, do, 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 marketing to learners, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ethan, right? So when we start talking about marketing to learners and, and, and I would say, right, if you were able to say, hey, learner, you know, we found that learners who did X, Y, and Z do better, that's awesome. Even, even better, good luck with your fire, Judy. Even better if we can market to managers, right? So, hey, team, you know, managers, your team is going to be able to perform much better. Um, so, okay, perfect, perfect. All right. Okay. Thank you. This feedback is excellent. So I, right in a session about data, um, I'm, I'm gathering, uh, feedback. So that's, uh, that's super, super awesome. Okay. Let's then dive into analytics. It's kind of the, the topic of the rest of this, knowing that analytics is not the only thing that we can do with data, right? Um, and all of these other things are, are right? you need the five Vs, you need enough data, you need all those concepts in order to do any of these five things at scale. Um, and, uh, and now we're gonna take a deep dive. This is where I really want, like, so my Vs and this, five chevron things and what i'm about to show you to all start intersecting and intersecting so i'm going to take analysis right um out there in the world right in the data space we didn't invent it i know it's referenced in donald clark's book that's coming out he didn't invent it either right um there are really um four again they're, they're, they're shown left to right. They're kind of as a progression. It does get harder the further you go. It requires more math the further you go. But any one of these still has value and use. So if you're on a particular chevron in the model, um, don't feel like that's a bad place to be. It actually may be where you need to be to solve the problems you have now, right? Um, but there are four, um, four buckets of analytics basically, right? So where descriptive analytics are really going to be around, um, you know, telling the story of what happened. Um, this is, 
and and it's it's a retrospective let's right look it's what happened in the past right um and it is um what we think about often when we think about learning evaluation right i am describing what happened in the learning and then describing what happened in the performance and connecting the two drawing a correlation between learning and performance is still descriptive right um and and descriptive information is where a lot of us start and I, i've got a reference here to um ben betts and his learning analytics maturity model which takes these four buckets and there's a, a a benchmark survey that you can benchmark your organization in across these four buckets, right? So it's it's pretty cool, um, and and I recommend that you you follow that, right? So um, the the descriptive space is really really powerful, really really important, and you kind of need it to get somewhere else. So yeah, you know what I think, and and, and to a certain extent, there's almost like a text that write a, a stacked taxonomy on here, right? Diagnostic analysis helps us why something happened in the past. Why did people who take this particular piece of learning do better in performance? Why did this particular piece of learning not have any impact on performance? Why did people stop watching the video on average after the first 31 seconds? Right. That what? So not just what happened, but why? Right? Predictive analytics, then, right, is where we st we stop looking at the past and we start looking at what might happen in the future. Right. So say at 31 seconds in the video, there's a fade to black. Right. And we figure out that that's why. Right. So our descriptive diagnostic says that. Um, or our descriptive stats said that people dropped off in the video at 30, 31 seconds. We run some diagnostics on it and we right, analyze what's on the screen relative to when people dropped off. And we find out that the reason why people dropped off is that there was a black that fades to black for three seconds and people assumed that that was the end of the video, so they closed it. When we predict, and this is a super basic example, right? Then our predictive model says that if we build videos, with a fade to black in the middle of it, people will stop watching them, right? Or better yet, if salespeople take two, two micro learning videos a week on product training and reinforcement, they sell those products more at the expense of other videos or other products. That's useful information too, right? Suddenly I'm being able to, to say, if I do this, what will happen, right? Prescriptive, kind of turns that inside out a little bit and says, right, how do I get the actions I want? If I want to drive sales of a particular product, if I want to improve quality of a particular product, if I want to do that, what and how should I do that? Right? If I want a particular reaction, exactly, right? If then statements, right? And, and the further to the right we get here, the more math that's involved. So I'm super excited that people are getting into math. I also am getting into math. And I, I, I find statistics to be the practical math that I was really excited about. And as interesting as it is to be able to calculate the, the, the volume of a curved funnel, right? It's calculus, right? But statistics is super interesting and, and going to be why you want to spend your, your math time here. So this is pretty interesting stuff, right? So we've got our, our different uses of data. We have analytics. We have different ways in which we can do analytics. You can benchmark your organization and your work against the uh, learning analytics maturity model. And there's all sorts of really great information um, and insights uh, there that Learning Pool provides. So I want to kind of toss that out. But let's take a deeper dive then into what's going on with descriptive analytics. Um, and um, I'm going to, as to um, assume, which may not be a safe assumption, so I'm, I'm calling out myself here knowing that this may not be a safe assumption, that um, Kirkpatrick capsule levels of evaluation, the level one, the level two, level three, level four, is something that we're all familiar with um, or, or vaguely familiar with. Um, and so I'm going to introduce Will Talheimer's learning transfer evaluation model, which is the sort of 
nerded out geekiness from an evaluation, learning evaluation perspective that I think this, uh, this group would appreciate. So learning transfer evaluation model, remember I will get you the, the link to this in uh, the Slack. Right? I'm gonna take a quick through. There are eight levels, again, left to right, does get more complex sometimes to measure, um, does get more depth, but it does not necessarily assume that better, that, that something on the right is better or more important than something on the left, right? Um, and, and knowing that they're numbered also like implies value, don't read too much into that, right? Quick breeze through, right? Those of you who are watching this on the replay, this is a great time to pause soak in all that's on the screen and then we'll keep moving, right? But we have, we, we start breaking down, right? Before we even get to the smile sheet, did you like the course? Um, was the coffee hot? Did you have any technical difficulties, right? We get into, right, attendance. Did people sign up? Did they show up? Who signed up? When, how, where did they sign up, right? When they were there, did they participate? Did they engage? Did they click on all of your hint buttons that you so artfully interspersed throughout your e-learning course, right? Um, when you ask them to type in chat or type in an answer, did they do that? How big was that? How, how useful was that? Was it the right answer, right? Um, and then, then we get our level three, right? Um, those perceptions, right? Um, are you motivated to apply this? What supports do you need? Did this really help you understand this concept, right? Testing, right? Knowledge and testing, right? um, both before and after. And testing is is, is something that the, the the beauty of the XAPI specification is already set up to handle handle test scores like out of the box, like really easy. Even even the Tory line and Captivate handle those like out of the box, right? Um, and then we start getting out into the real world, right? Five and six, can I make the right decisions? And when I make the right decisions, can I actually take the follow-up action and do the thing, right? Don't get too hung up. When I get instructional designers in here, they get super hung up on the difference between decision competence and task competence. And I say, don't don't get too hung up. Just like make sure you're, you're thinking about all the aspects of what it takes to actually act on that, right? Um, and, and, and so that is um, a, a uh, those two come together and, and and give a lot of people a lot of struggle. Seven is what we we often say that we want in our training and our learning experiences, right? Can people do it on the job? And then do they do it on the job, right? And then eight is really what are the effects on not only organizational results, right, which is what our bosses all say they want, but on people, on their coworkers, right? Are your coworkers happier humans now that you know how to do your job better? Maybe, because you're not bugging them all the time, right? What are some of these larger implications of, of why we're training? And um, Jess and I will go on all day long about <laughs> effects and, and equity and like the whole community and society and the environment, the whole nine yards, right? Um, and, uh, and which is why some of the paths to the dark crystal were longer than others because they got off on some really interesting rabbit holes. Um, but if we're looking at analytics, and we're looking at descriptive analytics, right? Having a framework or a schema that helps us think about what are all the things I could bring together to analyze, I find using these models really, really helpful as almost a checklist or performance support on making sure I'm thinking about all of the possible data points and questions I might have, right? Um, and so um, I'll say when you go out into the world, Kirkpatrick Katzel is obviously the one that more people know. I shouldn't say obviously, right? More people know those. Your bosses probably know those. Um, LTEM provides a really, really rich um, and deep exploration um, that kind of, uh, levels up really on, on Kirkpatrick Castle. Yeah. So we've now got big data or enough data. We've made sure our data set has enough V's to make sure it's meaningful. We've then said, given enough V's to make meaningful data sets, what can we do with it, right? We can dig around and find interesting stuff. We can visualize it, we can analyze it, we can use it 
in the learning experience, we can use it um, to trigger um, and initiate business action, right? When we're looking then within analytics, we have multiple schema by which I can, right, really, really dive deeply into descriptive analytics. L&D people, we got descriptive down, right? And so these are, these are ways in which we can be thinking about descriptive data, which is going to be most organizations first stop into analytics. When you come with descriptive data, once you've got that base covered, the next logical question is, oh, so why? That's your diagnostic data. What if that's your predictive data? And how do I get that, right? That's your prescriptive data, all right? So all of these things together, um, it, and, and so the, the, I, I got to this point, right? As I'm working this up, this is my dark crystal, and right? I got to this point, and then I realized, yeah, but how do I actually do it, right? And I can't remember who had the question earlier on today, right? Um, but, oh, Pedro, right? Definitely interesting, right? We just got to the definitely interesting. How do we actually do that? <laughs> Which is a brilliant question. I'm so glad you asked that, right? Um, once again, an inartful use of PowerPoint's smart art. There is a process for this, though, right? There is a process for this. Um, and... Um, I'm working through this with several clients right now, and it's 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 kind of a go slow to go fast, right? We're generating tons of data. We're all excited, right? And then we're going to say, hey, let's align this around goals. Let's find what I call them early experiment destinations, but it's really what are your questions? What are your hypotheses, right? Looking for anything that might be a big win or a quick impact, right? Get that underway first because that help me get funding and attention for the next one. Planning for implementation. This was one that got me tripped up, right? I was like, yay, let's do analytics. Let's just do it, right? And one of my clients said, okay, yeah, but our learning team is not ready to make decisions based on this because they don't understand it. I'm like, oh, we have to actually go in and build a culture of evaluation, not only right, the use of new tools and the comprehension of enough math and statistics to be able to feel confident in doing this. Okay. This is iterative. So the first time you're going to do something, you're going to get a data set and you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, I call it the yikes, my baby's ugly stage. It's like, oh, that's not exactly the data I wanted. Right. So we're going to iterate on that and keep keep going. Right. So when we talk about these early experiment definition destinations, um, whoops, wrong button. Right. We're really looking at questions. Right. So this book, Investigating Performance by Sean Putman and Janet Lana, Alana Efren, um, has a, a, a section of really great questions. Right. What are our questions about the, the data? Right. Um, and this is why part of why Kieran wanted to wanted this concept at the, the beginning, I'm guessing. Right. Because if I know what my questions are, then getting the right data makes it a lot easier. Right. So there's a whole section. This is an excellent book. I recommend you go out and get it. Um, we talked last week. I take my questions. Okay, and I then literally draw out. What the graph would look like. And then I look at the graph and say, yeah, no, that's a dumb graph. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, that, that's not interesting, right? Even before I know what the numbers are, right? So this wasn't XAPI data. This is actually from a couple weekends ago, I was working on a, a, a Learning Girl research report, right, where I have a ton of data. We interviewed eight, uh, 600 or surveyed 600 people about their learning technology roadmaps, right? And then we sliced it in a bunch of different ways, and I was trying to come up with, right, how am I, how am I going to visualize this, right? How am I going to work with this data? So I, I did want to at least uh, um, do that shout out. Uh, um, and and this work, this work has some boring parts, right? Um, there's the concept of the data supply chain, right? Where do I get my data from? How do I get my data all into the right place, right? Um, and and who are the people involved with that, right? That is way less fancy and fun than analytics. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, uh, but it's really important. And then even less fun and more boring is data cleaning. 
reducing duplicates or eliminating duplicates, right? Um, making sure that my data lines up. All those things that Rob Chadwick was talking last week about good data practices going in, that's actually data governance, um, so that I have less data cleaning to do, but there's always a certain amount of data cleaning that you should expect to do before you get in there, right? Um, like back in the olden days, right? We used to implement L LMSs. We'd hook them up to somebody's HRIS. And then they're like, oh my gosh, this is a horrible LMS. It's like, no, we're getting crummy data from your HR system, right? Um, and so you have to do a lot of that boring work. Um, and I wrote um, a boring article about all that boring work um, in Learning Solutions Magazine uh, a couple weeks ago. So, um, but but important stuff and, and skills to, to be uh, thinking about. The more fun stuff, um it are the kinds of statistics that you can use right so last week we had a client with a lot of um uh questioned it was it was a personalized adaptive learning environment around compliance training right and we were looking at right what what drives the adaptations in the learning experience and the item discrimination and differentiation around that right how difficult should a test question be, and how um, how do we know which questions to include that are actually relevant in your end performance? Right, there are statistics that actually tell you these things. Right, it's it's pretty awesome. Right, market basket analysis. Right, it's, it's like when you're shopping online and people who bought these two things tend to also buy this, so they offer you that. Right, um, it's how they design combo platters. Right, this food, these fries, these drinks. Regression, correlation, confidence, there's so much more. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that Quant Hub, um, if you are like geeked out by this list, right, or any of the other things that we're talking about, uh, we get free access to Quant Hub, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up with one, um, one last bit, and then I can take questions in chat if there are any questions or, or thoughts or comments um, while session or while, while we're getting feedback from from teams. But you know, we all grew up in the training world following a model here that has evaluation at the end after I've implemented something. Right. And what I right, if I bring in my agile project management for instructional design hat, right, we are evaluating up front and while we're going through a process so that by time we actually do release, we already have analytics and we've already been right. Our analytics has not only been refined because we're realizing our baby's ugly and we need to be asking better questions and shaping our data differently, but we're using those results to shape the design of the project differently. Um, and so Jess, I'm going to turn it back to you um, and, and the teams for team updates, Helena and others. I will answer questions in the chat. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for um, putting up with my crazy analogy to the Dark Crystal movie. Uh, dating myself, um, I'm incredible. I'm sure half of you, um, there, was, there was actually a second movie that came out like 25 years after that. So anyways, moving right along. Passing it off to somebody younger than me. Jess, take it away. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that framework, Megan. And thinking of, it reminds me a lot of like change management. All right, so we're going to hop into where your team should be now. And Helena, I do want to address your question. If you look in the, the demos um, and vendor offers Slack channel, all of the information that you need to know about Quant Hub is in there and how to sign up. Um, so we are actually officially in week nine. So we are in the, the demos and um, application phase, right, where we're doing some case studies to see some 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 demos and a new introduction of a framework. <laughs> Surprise! Um, and lots of resources. And I think, Megan, I should be able to share out your slides so that folks have access to all of them. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so this, we're now officially in times that you could be sharing out your work. Um, and I want to reiterate what Megan said, that sharing out your work doesn't mean it needs to be perfect. Megan just did a, a, an amazing, insightful presentation, and this was her first time. She asked for feedback, and now she knows to go and continue iterating that. And uh, doing your demo um, with Cohort is your chance to, to get some feedback on the spot. With that, I do have five teams that are here to present and share out their updates. So I'm going to pull up the GitHub um, and share my screen. It's going to look a little...
So I have, I'm gonna, and I, I'm going to rely heavily on my team today. I do not have a double monitor. Um, so I can only see the XAPI cohort GitHub page. So if you can make sure when I call your name that you give yourself mic access, um, I'm gonna start with Team A-Rise and I think that Rachel is here to give that presentation, to give that update. Rachel, can you hear me okay? All right, I'm not hearing Rachel, so I'm not sure if she has mic access issue or she's not there. Um, so I'm gonna hop into Brian Duck uh, with Team XAPI in live code. Hello. I hear you great, Brian. Okay, good. So we were able to meet, we've made some good progress in our projects. Um, you can see from the update, we have um, published update number 10. And part of our weekly meeting agenda yesterday was um, updates for project underway. Um, a number of us, like I mentioned, are working on things. So Joan has a version that um, has pushed her scripting for the buttons up to the card level, which allow us some um, dynamics around building additional cards within the project. Um, I published a version of, um, frankly, it's a derivative of what Joan had published before she made this change. And we as a group looked at the coding and the process, the progress that I had made. So we went through and identified, or Helen actually put together a sample PowerPoint for us. And we she identified some of the verbs associated with a video. So we went through and, and checked the scripting on that and put in sample uh, statements, and we actually published that out. We published that out to the SCORM cloud as an example statement to validate that uh, our tools are working and in working condition. Um, Martin was able to update his API via array, so he's actually working on code that builds the statement from um, individual fields and then builds it into an array, which is a variable in memory for the, the uh, live code tool we're using. Andrew had shown an example of a browser widget hack um, showing how to call back in, you know, to live code from the browser. So we're sending a message to the browser to load a file. And when we send statements in and out that browser, we actually have to do some coding to pull that data back into live code. We refer to that as a, as a callback. And then uh, he's also working on a version to create a, creating HTML on the fly using some uh, JavaScript techniques. So he has a sample file that we've published up into, uh, into um, Slack in our Slack channel that people can see if they want to see that. And then the other thing we're doing is we're working on some of the part two projects um, that will allow us to elaborate interacting with video. Martin has a sample project for that. And then as I mentioned, or I didn't mention, but Andrew's other project is interacting with the browser widget and other tools for displaying PDFs. And part of that effort is to grab the information about where a viewer is looking at the PDF, how long they're staying on each page, whether they've actually paged through and looked at each page and have reached the end of the document. So we're actually able to, are working towards being able to evaluating how much time they're spending on that, on the individual pages and gathering information. Um, and that's pretty much where we're at. What we're working on for next week is further development of those learning record or activity provider projects that I mentioned and then elaboration of these part two projects as well, where we'll be focused from then on. The video example and the PDF example is what we're elaborating. Um, awesome. So that's pretty much it for Team XP API and Live Code. Thank you, Brian. Um, and I think that I have Matt here from Team Slack. While we're waiting on Matt, Jess, Rachel from Team Arise is here, so if we okay. want to circle back later, but we, cool. Matt can go now. 
Why don't you go ahead, Rachel? I heard you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And I'm sorry to jump in on that. Um, so I don't know how to use GitHub. So I'm probably not going to have updates up here. Um, I'm lost with that. But um, this week, uh, I met with Matt, and he talked through some things to help with the XAPI statements and, and building it. So um, people can have like anonymous exploration, but we still collect data in the um, online uh, gallery in the online museum experience. Um, I put in the hashtag team rise in Slack, um, putting out that I want to get us together and start planning out and doing like a brainstorming for what um, uh, XAPI statements, what kind of data we want to collect, because it's a pretty big experience. And because the link is internal, I'm only going to share it with the people that join the call. But I was going to just put it out on the Slack, but I don't know if I can. Um, so if anyone's interested in brainstorming what XAPI statements, what kind of data we can collect from the online museum experience, uh, join our channel and let me know if you can join on a Thursday. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Matt, were you able to hop in? All right. Um, it looks like some accomplishments for this week is that Stefan was able to join the weekly meeting um, and go through a Slack connector. Um, they're, what they want to accomplish in the next week is they're going to replicate Stefan's process on their own and see how that goes. Uh, so they got some support and they're going to iterate on that. I know that Miranda's not here today and not able to present on Team Goodish, so they <laughs> did not finish their project, April Fools. They tested their prototype and made some adjustments, um, found a bot template that they're going to experiment with and set up their repository um, and their, LR, their LRD um, and CodePen account. What they want to accomplish in the next week is some coding, hopefully using Zappoli, um, and then sending some tests test statements. Um, do we have, I know that Judy was on the line um, for Team Zombie Pebble, but then I know she had to hop off. So Helena, I think that you were going to maybe present out on Team um, Zombie Pebble? Um, yeah, I can. Okay. Did you want to share an update? Yeah, sure. Um, I should be a pin. I don't know why it's not showing up in the GitHub, because I update the GitHub. It should be there. It might be in the wrong um, the wrong semester. So we can get you all set up, but I'm not seeing it populate um, in our, our list. So if you want to just oh. talk through an update, that's fine. OK, I just sent the link to where I'm updating the um, GitHub. So uh, we actually, we met yesterday. So we're what we accomplished was uh, creating a zombie map um in the authoring tools so we have the beta version now um we still have some issues like polling software and trying to do some crowdsourcing we're still working on that we don't know if that's going to be available but we at least do have like a map so we can like know where all the zombies are located we decided to do development as one team as opposed to people going in and using different logins so we're going to do joint development and judy did send out um, one login for the three of us to actually use. Um, Judy actually worked on embedding the map. That was something she did while um, in the meeting. Uh, we're still looking at setting up triggers to go to certain pages within the um, the Pebble. Um, we just worked on setting up some content morphing. And we also learned that the data actually flows, like we can get XAPI data directly from our libraries into Learning Locker. So we don't have to write statements. I thought we had to do that. And that's something I learned yesterday that I don't have to do that now. So um, Julie tested that out and it actually works. So that's where we are right now. So we're still working on um, updating the software from the, uh, the storyboard that has been completed and um, moving right along. So that's pretty much it. Awesome. Thank you for that, Helena. Um, Kieran with Team um, Visualizing S S Learner Behavior. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. 
Perfect. Yes. Hooray. Yes. One of your computers. Hopefully this will work better. Um, <laughs> last time um, I showed you a, a video of a visualization of a dog who's watching some data uh, come down, watching a learner run through some lessons. And you can watch as they jump around through different pages. Um, and that, that works pretty well, uh, except that I figured out while I was doing that, that I'd made a mistake in the Zappy emission code. Um, so uh, this past week I went back and corrected that. Um, so we're now getting a brand new juicy, tasty data. In, in the course of that though, I figured out today, maybe I broke something else. Ah! <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I'm going to go back and look at that um, again today, and, and hopefully next time I will have sorted that out, and we'll have some new dog-based visualizations. Uh, Joan has been looking at doing some other things with a different data set, um, with more, maybe more traditional um, analysis that looks more looks more serious, and we can frown about rather than having a dog there. So that's where we are. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hop back into the wrap up. I know that we are right at three o'clock, so I'm going to go through this. Um, feel free to message me um, on Slack. I'm going to put a voting poll in the main channel for you to select a slot to sign up for. We do have Team XAPI and Live Code signed up for 422, which leaves uh, two open slots there um, and three still on 415. Um, we'll make room if there's more demand. Presentations are, are brief. Um, but usually folks do use a slide deck. Um, we still are, are accepting proposals for the XAPI party and LND download. So feel free to, to sign up there and this link will be sent in our weekly update. If you don't wanna present, you just wanna attend, you can register right online on our XAPI cohort page. Uh, with that, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, we have case studies next week. Uh, and I do for Brian, uh, I pulled in uh, Jimmy Scott time after time to wrap us up today. Um, have an amazing Thursday um, and welcome to the second quarter of the year and happy April.